Well, as you probably already figured out, my, uh, my video stopped. So this is part two of our April 15th Wednesday night Bible study in Luke chapter 18 and chapter 19. And I just finished reading the uh, first 10 verses of Luke 19, which deals with my, one of my favorite Bible stories about a man named Zacchaeus. Now, it appears that Jesus is just going to pass through Jericho but the Father, the Heavenly Father, had a divine appointment for him. And so Jesus, as he was passing through, he came in contact with this man named Zacchaeus. And uh, it reminds me of a truth, a very important principle, that sometimes the greatest opportunities we have as Christians to witness for Christ is when we're just passing through. It's just one of those occasional, unexpected opportunities that we get to share Jesus. So just keep that in mind as we, as we look at this. Uh, t together. Now Luke is the, absolutely the only one of the Gospels that tell us about Zacchaeus and his story. And Zacchaeus' name actually means the righteous one. Uh, but he was certainly not living up to his name because uh, Zacchaeus was a tax collector and he collected taxes for the Romans. But tax collectors were also notorious for taking too much money and, and stealing money. And so as far as the Jews are concerned, tax collectors were traitors and were looked upon very poorly. And so, um, Jesus' concern, though, was not about a traitor. Jesus' concern was about a sinner. And so, um, it's interesting that the story goes that Zacchaeus, when he heard that Jesus was coming to town, that uh, he ran to a sycamore tree, and he climbed up in the sycamore tree, uh, first of all, it's very unusual for a, a Jewish man, a grown Jewish man, an adult Jewish man, to run any, at, at any time. And even more unusual for him to climb a tree. And yet, Zacchaeus was so curious about this, seeing this man, Jesus, he'd heard so much about. He, he ran, and he climbed up into this tree. Now, I think Zacchaeus probably thought that he was seeking out Jesus. But the truth was, Jesus was seeking him out. When he came, when Jesus came to the tree where Zacchaeus had climbed up, he looked up and he spoke to Zacchaeus by name. He said, Zacchaeus, I want you to come on down out of that tree and I'm going to go to your house today. He kind of invited himself to Zacchaeus' home. Now, we don't have any idea about how God had been working in Zacchaeus' life. Um, it could be that Matthew, also a tax collector, one of Jesus' disciples, had a relationship with Zacchaeus. We don't know. Uh, it's possible that Zacchaeus had, um, because of the things he had done and, and, and the emptiness of wealth, that he was searching for something. The only thing we really know about Zacchaeus was he was very, very serious about finding out who this Jesus fellow was and that he was a very short man in statues. Um, the reason he climbed the tree was because he wanted to be able to see Jesus and get a, a good view of Jesus. And so Jesus, when Jesus invited him to come on down and that he was going to go to his house, uh, Luke says that he shimmied on down the tree and he was so excited and joyful about the idea of Jesus coming to his house. And we don't know how long that conversation was that Jesus had. It could have been hours. It could have been all afternoon. But Jesus spent some time with Zacchaeus and at some point during that conversation, I believe that Zacchaeus was gloriously saved. Now, he wasn't saved because he promised to do good. Some people get that impression as they read this story. No, he was saved because he responded to Jesus' invitation and by faith trusted in Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And so the promise to give, um, give half of his goods to the poor, to, to pay fourfold pay those back that he had taken money from, um, that was not proof, that, that was not um, what saved him, that was the evidence or the proof that he was saved. It's interesting that joy is one of the common themes in Luke. It's mentioned over 20 times. Uh, if you may recall, about a month ago, we looked at the parables of the, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. And uh, in each one of those stories, there was someone joyful. The angels were rejoicing when the, when the, 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 the shepherd found his sheep, it says, when a lost sinner comes home, the woman had a party that lost the coin and she was joyful and celebrated with friends. And then the father in the, the parable of the prodigal son was joyful when his son, who was lost, had now been found. 
So the experience of being saved surely ought to produce great joy in that person's heart that's, that's been saved. And I think that's a principle we can, we can all believe. Now, this Sunday, I just want to mention this before I pray. This Sunday, I'm going to preach on how should we pray. I don't know if you've noticed, but lately there's been a lot of interest in praying. And people are praying that they don't get the virus. And people are praying that, that their elderly parents don't get the virus. And, and people are praying that uh, for the hospital and the, uh, the nurses and the doctors and those that are taking care of these people that have the coronavirus. Um, all good things, I think. But my question is, how should you and I pray? What should we pray for as Christians? Now, several weeks ago, I preached on why there are storms, and the coronavirus is certainly a very big storm that's coming into our lives. And I gave you three reasons the Bible tells us that there's storms. The first one is to remind us of our fallen, sinful world. Over, we go through life, and we constantly have storms, and it reminds us of the fact we're living in a fallen world. The second reason, though, I think that God allows storms in life is it serves as a warning to those who are lost that there's a hell. If you do not repent of your sins and do not trust in Christ, your destiny will be a place of eternal storms, eternal suffering. And then finally, we said that the, the storms serve as an opportunity to those of us who are saved. It serves as an opportunity to test our faith to see how genuine it is. Now, in light of God's purposes for storms, I want to ask you, how do you think we should be praying? Maybe, maybe I could even make it this way. I could question it this way. How do you think Jesus wants us to be praying during this crisis? I want to challenge you to take your Bibles and look and read Matthew 6, verses 8 through 13. You're going to find the very familiar verses. It's the Lord's Prayer. But I don't want you to just to, to quote the Lord's Prayer. I want you to look at the words in the prayer, and I want you to read it very carefully and say, what and how does this help us understand what we should be praying for when it comes to the coronavirus and the storm we're in right now? That's what we want to look at this Sunday. And I plan to take this prayer and use it as a blueprint to help us to do just that. So I'm going to ask you to pray for me, and, I'm going to be, and I want to be praying for you. You need to pray for yourself, that as we seek God's wisdom together, that God will show us how and what we should be praying for. And what I think is one of the scariest in, and probably one of the strangest times in our lives. Also, I want to mention that this Sunday night, we're going to, or this Sunday after the end of the service, we're going to be observing the Lord's Supper. And uh, so at the end of the service, uh, We'll, I'll come down and I'll go through the Lord's Supper like I normally do. But you need to be prepared as you're in your homes with the juice and the, and the bread so that you'll have something to take and observe the Lord's Supper with us. And I'm looking for a really, really great Sunday. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for the opportunity to study your word. Thank you for Luke 18 and 19. Thank you for this blind man who, who who's not only did he see physically, he, he, he learned to see spiritually. And I believe he was saved. For the story of Zacchaeus, who is another example of someone who was seeking uh, to know Jesus and found him. Uh, Lord, we pray for this Sunday as we seriously ask ourselves, what should we be praying? How should we be praying for the things that are going around and with the coronavirus? And I just know that you're going to guide us and help us to your wisdom to know why, how, and what to pray. And until that time, I pray, Father, that you'll be with us. And we do pray for our safety. That you'll watch over us now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. And I look forward to talking to you again next week.